All right, cool. So, uh, yeah, I'm Thomas French with my colleague Fred Farrell. Uh, I'm the CTO at Sandtable, and, and Fred's a data scientist. Uh, so, just to give you a little bit, a yeah, very quick background, Sandtable, we're a data science company. We specialize in agent-based modeling. Um, it was the first commercial projects in 2009, and uh, we're currently, since last summer, we're 50% owned by Dunhumby. Uh, so, Dunhumby is uh, a majority owned by Tesco, and they, their asset is kind of the loyalty card data. So we've been working to build models off that, consumer models, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that as well. So other people that we work with in the public sector, projects with Public Health England, we work for the Cabinet Office, um, and we've done projects, say, with Tesco and people like Coca-Cola as well. Okay, so quickly, um, I'll give an introduction, kind of overview of what agent-based modeling is. Then we'll talk about, Fred's going to talk about some work we've been doing modeling the London riots, 2011. Um, and then I'll give you a quick kind of touch on kind of data science platform that we're building to support this work. Uh, okay, so wider context, we live in an increasingly complex and dynamic world. Um, you know, on the technology side, we've got increasing computing power, it's cheaper, available by things, you know, technologies such as the cloud. Um, and of course, I mean, we're all here, we all know this, more and more data is being collected, finer, finer levels of granularity, etc. So, you know, we believe if we can understand the world, we can make better decisions about uh, and better planning and allocate resources and this type of thing. So I like the, qu the quote from Ion Stoica, professor at Berkeley, who's also the professor behind Spark and Mesos. Um, he said that data is only as valuable as the decisions that it enables, right? I'm sure you kind of all understand that. So I wanted to give you a quick kind of just overview of the type of questions that we kind of, you know, questions that get asked of us and the type of stuff that we're interested in modeling and using agent-based modeling for. So we like to say that we focus more on kind of strategic level questions rather than tactical solutions. Um, so we're interested in things like how we're changing attitudes towards health, you know, impacting the sales of soft drinks, uh, how do people respond and how can we, you know, how do we understand how they respond to things like advertising, why and how do people um, quit smoking, so that's the project we're working with Public Health England, um, you know, how do sexually transmitted diseases spread through social networks, uh, and how do we get people to wash their hands more places like India, so that's another project that we've, we've worked on. So what we're interested in here within this wider context is behavior change, okay? So what is agent-based modeling? Well, it's a modeling technique, as, as the clue's in the name. So what do we, we build representations of real systems, of real, we're trying to model real phenomena. Um, it has its roots in complexity science, complexity systems, so people are interested in studying kind of biological systems, complex adaptive systems. Um, and particularly, it gets bandied around quite a lot, but the notion of emergence. So what exactly does emergence need? Uh, so the idea here in, in complexity science is that they're interested in a macro level, you might get these sort of complex behaviors, but actually underneath it, the micro level, you've got very simple rules of behavior. So through these interactions and through these simple rules, you get this emergence of kind of more complex behavior. Um, we use it particularly interested in, in behavioral modeling. Um, so understanding kind of modeling human behavior, and kind of thinking about why people do what they do and how we can influence that and be, and, you know, for behavior change. Um, so really we talk about we're building hypotheses of behavior. Um, and of course, true to its roots, you know, we do this bottom up. So we model, so I'll talk, I'll give more, you know, more detail on this, but really we're talking about building these systems bottom up. So giving, identifying the kind of basic entities, in our case would be humans and individuals, and thinking about simple rules of behavior simple rules that guide them and then observing that and observing what happens at a more macro, macro level. So I'll, you know, it's a bit abstract, I'll, I'll give, some, uh, give some examples of that. And we also find that, you know, the interesting thing about the bottom up is it's quite an accessible metaphor. So as an approach to modeling, you know, people can intuitively understand and kind of see, you know, understand more about what's going on and understand what's going on inside. So here's a quite a, almost playful, but sort of view of what is an agent-based model. So the basic entities in it are the agents, they're situated in an environment. In our case, uh, you know, we tend to work in computer kind of simulations, virtual environments. So the agents have, are situated in this environment and they have rules of behavior and we give them attitudes and attributes. So for example, an attribute would be some kind of demographic, an age, and then attitudes would be you know, their beliefs about the world, what they believe to be true and what they, um, how they act. Uh, and of course, they interact with each other and they interact with their environment as well. Um, but for us, I mean, we work with, tend to, well, in terms of the physical kind of environment, you know, that could be a kind of geo geographical space or it could be kind of a social network. So we've tended to look at kind of social network stuff more than geographical. Okay. 
So I thought I'd give you an example of kind of the classic kind of old school agent-based model. So in the 1970s, Nobel Prize winning economist Thomas Schelling in the United States was interested in racial segregation and how this was, how this was emerging. Um, and he was particularly interested in how individual preferences could lead to this, you know, this kind of macro phenomena. Um, so he built, apparent, I think it was on an airplane, he decided to do this. Um, and part of the reason we like showing this is because it's actually not a computational ABM. It's, you know, it's it has a physical kind of manifestation. Um, so what he, what he decided to do was to build this model is he said, look, I've got these individuals. I'm going to place them randomly on a grid. I'm going to tap, there's going to be two types of agents. And they are going to have what we call some measure of sameness of whether they're happy. So the idea was they look at their immediate neighbors and given some threshold, they decide whether they're happy or not with that. And if they're not happy, they move. Okay, so a very simple rule of behavior here is they look at their environment and they judge whether they're happy or not given some threshold. And if they're not happy, then they move. And if they are happy, they stay. Okay, so it's very simple. You're either, they're either happy or they're unhappy. If they're unhappy, they move to a random location. And if they're happy, they stay. Okay, so we thought as a tribute to Schelling, we thought we would do this with a stopgap kind of video. So we took a grid. We took two P's and 10 P coins. We placed them randomly on the grid. And then we, we applied this rule of behavior manually um, and then you can see, so you can see what happens. Oops, sorry. Should play. Okay. So over time, we're judging the coins and saying, are they happy or not? If they're not happy, we're randomly moving. And you'll see as it evolves. You get the segregation emerging. So of course it, it, it converges, so there are some rules about that, but yeah, it, it, you know, in general, if you set up in the right way, it will converge and then you'll get, this, you'll get this end state. So, I mean, in some level, it wasn't particularly surprising, right? If people are not happy, they're gonna move, they're gonna segregate. But the, what the, thing, the interesting insight that Schelling had was that actually if individuals have a high tolerance for other types, you can still get this macro level behavior. So that was interesting. So even when kind of at the lower level, people are actually quite tolerant of others, it emerges that you can get this sort of segregation. So that was quite interesting, right? Because I guess people at the time would have assumed that that would own, you know, even if people, people weren't tolerant or you would, yeah, et cetera. Okay, so how do we derive these rules of behavior? Um, well, it will, you know, will depend on what's available, will depend on the project, but generally we will speak to the domain experts. We'll talk to people who know the behavior of, of the target kind of group of the agents. So we'll talk to them and extract kind of rules of behavior. Um, and increasing in complexity, you know, then if, you know, we'll use survey data as well. So what people kind of report and their own behavior and their own attitudes. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll also, when we have access, we'll use behavioral data. So individual level data, we can extract rules from that to see what people do, you know, what they buy and what they, um, what they actually do rather than necessarily what they report they do. And then finally, you know, we've started using things, techniques, unsupervised machine learning techniques to help us extract rules um, from larger data sets, more complex data sets, more higher dimensional. Okay, so how do we actually build these things? Um, so when we started, when the first ABMs were built in this kind of well-known um, development environment called NetLogo, open source, um, and that was sort of the original models. And that allows you to quick kind of prototype, quickly prototype in a way, and it's got widgets and it's quite nice. But we moved on quite relatively quickly on to um, Another package called Repast, which is again open source, C++, give you a nice scale. You can run lots of models, lots of simulations. Um, and then we moved to a hybrid. And eventually we wrote our own kind of lightweight ABM package. Um, and that was really because, well, the, you know, the, the cost of getting going on the C++, it could give us scale, but it couldn't give us the agility. So, you know, hence we're at PyData. We're big fans of Python. So we've built this library. It allows us to quickly prototype, to stay agile with it. Um, and of course, we have access to the to the wonderful ecosystem around around PyData. Um, and then to support that, we wrote a cluster framework that allows us to spawn up in the cloud in EC2, launch lots of in, uh, instances to run large scale simulations to calibrate um, and, and explore the models. So just to give you a quick a quick sense of what it actually would look like. So here's a typical kind of ABM you know, algorithm in pseudo code ish. Um, so of course, we read in read in some time series about the environment. Um, we've got, we read in the agents, the attributes, and how they're placed within a social network. And then we have what we call the two loops. So the simulation loop over time, 
uh, and then the inner loop for the agents. Um, and here we're taking again, so we're reading inputs in, um, processing messages perhaps from a social network, making decisions about that, and then sending messages out over a social network. So that would give you some idea. Okay, so of course the big question is how do you, that's all well and good, you can build a model about anything, how do you actually, you know, how do you actually validate it? Um, so this is, a, you know, this is a bit, I'm being a bit cheeky here, of course, because in our world, you know, is a model ever validated? I mean, it will always, it's by definition, in some ways, an approximation of the real system. So, you know, it's, it's, and as George Box famously said, all models are wrong, some are useful. So how do we, how do we do it? Well, depending, again, depending on the case, depending on how much data there is, I mean, we will look, you know, initially there will be a certain amount of visual validation. We'll be looking for types of behavior. We'll be looking for trends, trying to say, does this, you know, fit with our own intuition and our own understanding of the world? And then moving down to more detailed kind of analysis. So if there's data available, you know, we'll be, yeah, both at the micro and the macro levels, um, validating individual based models, um, using multiple data sets, of course, if we can, validating against reference data, and, you know, of course, um, using training and testing, splitting up the data sets when, when appropriate. Okay, so that's a pretty quick tour. So I'm going to hand over to Fred, who's going to talk about the London Riots model that we've been uh, we've been building. Okay, I'll stay here. All right. All right. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to tell you a bit about an example of a model that we've been building at Sandtable. Um, so this is a sort of ongoing proof of concept model of um, the London Riots that happened in 2011. So this is kind of a, a good example to show sort of the capabilities of agent-based modeling. Um, so you've got kind of a system which involves um, a lot of agents, um, these agents have behaviors, and you kind of have behavior arising out of the individuals which is um, sort of emerges out of the behavior of lots of individual people. So it's kind of the kind of system that we um, want to explore using agent-based modeling. Um, so in this model we'll have uh, two kinds of agents. We have writers and police, um, and these agents are interacting with each other. Um, so that's kind of a <coughs> typical kind of system you want to use this <coughs> technique for. Okay. So to give you some uh, just some context, I'm sure everyone's very familiar with, with what happened. Um, so in 2011, there were widespread protests in London following the shooting of Mark Duggan by police. And um, these protests turned violent and then led to widespread rioting throughout London. And then they spread to various cities throughout England as well. Um, and so there's some statistics here about sort of the extent of the damage and the, and the rioting. Um, yeah, so, so obviously this was a, a huge event and there's a lot of interest in kind of understanding what was going on, you know, like how we can do better in, in the future in terms of dealing with these kind of events. Um, so, yeah, so, we've, so our model is kind of not so much trying to understand, you know, the sort of fundamental reasons why this kind of thing happens, but looking at the dynamics of how something like this spreads and how different for example, policing strategies might cause it to evolve in a different way. Uh, so this work was based on a scientific paper which, was, um, which came out in 2013 um, by Toby Davies and Hannah Fry, who are both at UCL. Um, and they developed this mathematical model of the London riots um, and also the policing. Um, yeah, so I'll just uh, explain this preamble to you a bit. Um, so this was a mathematical model um, in which the behavior of writers and of police um, was kind of you know, coded in, in mathematical equations and these were solved. Um, so it was quite, you know, just based on some quite simple assumptions about people's behavior. Um, so you have, uh, so it was assumed that, because uh, in this, um, in these riots, most of the activity was at large retail sites. So that's kind of what they based it on. So you have a map of London and the largest retail sites in London, uh, you know, are the potential riot sites and you have agents throughout the city and they will look around at the nearby retail sites and if there's a large site um, that will sort of be attractive to them and they'll also try and go to places where there are riots already occurring and where the rioters outnumber police. The basic kind of motivation people have is to go somewhere where they can riot and they're not very likely to be arrested um, and also that people from more deprived areas are more likely to riot because um, that's obviously what was, what was observed. Um, and then also you have the police, so the police basically will just move around the city to places where, a lot of riot, where large riots are happening and, um, and arrest people and try and disperse them. And using this sort of simple model, they were actually able to broadly reproduce the geographical distribution of the disorder. So, the kind of, um, so that's kind of shown on the map at the top there, um, just like different boroughs and how much rioting happens in them. 
and also for specific um, resale sites where there were large amounts of disorder. So for example, here they sort of started small riots in a few different retail sites and, uh, and see what happens in the model. And in Clapham Junction, for example, uh, it picked up to a very large riot, whereas in these other sites, which are nearby, um, it pieces out very quickly. And kind of what drives that is the, uh, the size of the retail site and sort of proximity to a large number of people from deprived areas. So our aim was to um, build an agent-based model um, kind of inspired by this work, sort of encoding the same kind of assumptions, um, but allowing us, uh, but by using agent-based modeling, it's kind of a bit more um, sort of agile. We can uh, like explore lots of different scenarios um, quite easily rather than having to like write down new equations, you know. Um, so we have an environment, which in this case is London. So it's like a spatial model. Um, and in that uh, environment, we have writers who are, have a spatial location in the city and riot sites. They also have a spatial location. And then additionally, the police. Uh, yeah. So we have about 12,000 potential rioters and about 1,000 police. Uh, the simulation runs over um, 48 hours, with each time step being an hour. Um, and the basic way that it works is rioters, well, first of all, police will move to sites which have the most rioters. They'll make arrests. And then potential rioters will make their decision of what to do. So this involves looking around them at all the sites that are nearby um, and the number of rioters and police at each site. Um, move it, and then, depending on what the situation is, they'll decide whether to riot or not and also which site to go to if they do. So. In addition to those effects, which were kind of what made up the, the academic model that we were basing this on, um, we put in a few extra effects to kind of look at uh, different scenarios in terms of police strategy um, and also media. So one is that it's going to take the police a certain amount of time to travel through the city. Um, and that's sort of observed to be quite an important factor in, um, in how policing and riots works, how quickly you can respond to new information, um, new things that are happening in the city. So um, police can take a certain amount of time from when they want to go somewhere to actually arrive there. Um, and another effect we consider is uh, the media. So in, uh, in the model we base this on, everybody, police and writers, has perfect information um, about what's going on everywhere, which is not very realistic. So we can also put in an idea of media, so an idea of sort of knowledge. So we can do this in two ways. Um, with one um, method which we kind of call social media is that people who are writing, people who are out in the city, can send out messages about what's happening. So and kind of let everyone know that at the place that they're at, there are this many writers, this many police, and that might encourage more people to come. And you also have broadcast media, which is that if there's a large riot happening, then uh, the news might cover, the, cover it. So then everyone will find out about what's happening there. That also can attract people. OK, okay so I'm just going to show you a demo of the model. Just try that. Um, yep, so this is the kind of um, dashboards we have for visualizing um, what happens in the model. So here we have the map of London, um, which is where the model kind of takes place. Um, and we have a graph here which is going to show uh, sort of total activity, what's going on in the model. So the yellow line will be a yellow line showing total number of people rioting, and a red line uh, showing total number of police officers. Um, and on the map, you'll see uh, rioters and police kind of um, moving around. So you'll have uh, yellow circles representing the number of writers at a site, and red circles um, representing the number of police. So I'll just run this. Um, so this is kind of the first version I'm going to show you is kind of the, the version which is like what was in the paper, where you have perfect information and the police can move around um, sort of immediately. Yep, so then it starts. You have sort of a big flare up in various. Um, sites, kind of mostly in the more deprived areas, which are darker colors. Um, and then it kind of, the police can deal with it very quickly. And then you just okay, get occasional flare-ups as time goes on, uh, with the police able to sort of call it quite quickly. Okay. OK, so now um, I'm going to show you a version where we have this lag in the police response. Again, we start with a, a large fire up, 
but it takes the police a little longer to get there, so the, the, the initial kind of um, event is, is larger. And then also it takes longer um, for the police to kind of quiet things down because as people are arrested, they'll start to just go to what you know, disorder will start on other sites and the police can't immediately get there. So there's a kind of gradual tailing off uh, with the sort of oscillation as um, that time goes on. And finally, I'll show you the version where we have this kind of social media effect. So in this case, people don't have perfect information of what's going on. The only way they can find out is by other people who are already out there sending messages out, um, telling people what's going on. Okay. Uh, so in this case, this really dampens down the total amount of activity that occurs because uh, people just aren't as aware of what's going on. And uh, you see that there's, you know, there's a lot of very small um, events, but very rarely you just get a slight, you get a much bigger one as it kind of something attracts uh, more attention uh, in the media, and everyone kind of will go back. So that's one of the times that is much bigger. Okay. Yeah. So at the moment, as I say, this is still quite a sort of proof of concept. Um, so moving forward, we really want to be able to validate this model against real data, so sort of see how accurate it is, um, and uh, so that we can kind of have some confidence that we're kind of broadly capturing the main effects, what, what, what drives this kind of thing. So we could use that for that. We could use, for example, data on um, the geographical spread of the disorder, um, for example, uh, locations of arrests and where people came from, where they were arrested, the nature of the crime, um, and also police numbers, writer numbers. Um, so we can kind of you know, try and match up the main effects. And then once we've done that, we can then start to explore counterfactuals. So what would have happened if police had responded differently than they did? How would that have um, affected the way that the disorder um, went on? Yeah. Okay, so I'll hand back to Thomas. Can you just quickly remind us how the information is spread in the first example? Um, so then everyone just has perfect information. Okay, yeah, so just to add to that, thanks Fred. Um, just to say, you might wonder how would that be used? How would that kind of um, tool be used? So well, we think about it, but it could be used in a number of ways. So first of all, you obviously you want to get up to a point where you're confident with it um, and you can gather, you know, using data and using kind of getting experts' views on it and that type of thing. Um, so you might, for example, you might use it as a training tool. So you could use with, with, with police and, and look at how, how you respond and look at the different ways of strategy and look at how, you know, things evolve. So it's in that. And then of course, on top of that, you could use it as a planning tool. Um, so that's how we think about it. We think that you know, you're bringing together a lot of assumptions, a lot of understanding about um, this type of phenomena and the dynamics, and it could be used as a planning tool. So you wouldn't be using it if the London riots, if some potentially you know, happened, something like this happened again, you wouldn't pull this tool in and say, okay, what's gonna happen tomorrow? It's much broader than that. You'd be looking at you know, for training and for, for planning. So it's, we think about it as that you're being explicit about your assumptions, you're being explicit about what you know, and you know, this is an opportunity to kind of explore that and obviously a low cost, kind of virtual environment. Okay, so I want to just touch on um, something else that we're doing. So, you know, our, our data scientists, you know, are big Pythonistas, they love, you know, using the tools, um, using the notebooks. Um, we've also been kind of looking at Luigi pipelines to help us with some of the calibration pipelines and deployment. Um, and what we've end up kind of on this journey is we've end up building a, you know, a platform um, which we use um, to kind of do collaborative agile data science. Um, and we think that it's interesting and, um, you know, we've integrated the notebooks and we're finding a number of services around that. So we've actually written a white paper about this that kind of has a view on how we see data science evolving and, and also talking about this, this platform. So if you're interested, um, check it out. We've, yeah, it's up on, up on the site. So to summarize, um, we use HMS modeling to understand behavior and helping us design policies for, for behavior change. Um, applicable to strategic type of problems. So again, you wouldn't use it for solving kind of tactical, tactical problems. Um, and we use it, you know, we simulate, we use simulation for exploring counterfactual, even exploring kind of future what-if scenarios. Um, you know, with, we're starting to think about how we can package these up as, as data products. Um, and yeah, finally, you know, the Python data stack is crucial to, to our work. Um, and we're, yeah, we're developing, developing this platform around that to, uh, to help our guys work effectively. So, yeah, thanks. And if you're interested in finding out a bit more, it's a great 
Macau and North have a great paper from the Winter Simulation Conference, and Scott Scott Page's course on Coursera is really good about model kind of model thinking. Thank you, Thomas and Fred. Uh, do you have questions? Topic. Maybe my question. Yeah, so the sensitivity, the sensitivity of the model. Sorry, could yeah. you repeat the question as well for the purposes of the recording? I can. So if you change inputs, so the question is really if you change the inputs, what kind of impact does that have on the outputs? So yeah, very much a classic kind of uh, sensitivity analysis type of thing. Um, yeah, it will depend. I mean, we do we do try to explore the models to understand that because I mean, once you know, the models can get quite complex, and of course that's part of the kind of difficulty is you're putting in these simple rules, but as things start to interact, you can get a lot of effects. Um, so we do try to explore the models and understand that, and that's sort of one of the outputs that you'll you know one of the jobs of building the models is to understand that how sensitive they are to slight changes. I mean, that's kind of what we focus on, the broader. You know, giving, I mean, there'll be uncertainty. I mean, effectively, when there's stochastic elements of these models, we're doing Monte Carlo simulation. So, you know, there's uncertainty there and randomness that we need to take account for as well. So, we, we try not to focus on, you know, this number, but understanding broadly, depending on how confident we are, depending on how much data it's calibrated to, we won't be very certain about the numbers. So, we have to take account for that and also more than that, just the variation coming out as well. Yeah. Question over here. Feedback loops, yeah, absolutely. But that's kind of why we wouldn't we wouldn't use it as a tactical tool to inform. You know, I mean, feedback loops. Everyone has that problem, right? I mean, it's, yeah. So, I mean, definitely, we wouldn't we wouldn't want to make claims about. We wouldn't calibrate it to a an unfolding scenario and say this is where it's going to go. I mean, again, agent-based modeling can give you a model that's sufficient, but not necessary. So in the sense that we can give you a hypothesis about what's going on, but we, you know, we can't tell you what happened. I mean, right? I mean, who, you know, that's <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Is it, sorry, it might be naive again, but is there like some crossover with genetic algorithms and that sort of stuff, population growth? Um, that's my, my previous uh, interest evolutionary algorithms and this sort of thing. Uh, I, no, I mean, you know, I'd say there's a metaphor that there's some, you know, overlap, but, but I mean, you know, GAs, every, EAs are very adaptable. You can use them in a number of different ways, I mean, I suppose, but yeah, not, not really, not really. I was just wondering what the kind of thought process or, or process was for coming up with the behavior model in the first place, whether it's yeah. more of a, uh, a soft thing or would be people or Asians will behave in this way, or whether it's more of a, yeah. um, let's just throw lots of parameters in and see what <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, we, if you want to get kind of down the statistical route, I mean, we've, we've focused more on explanatory type of modeling, right, than the predictive modeling. I mean, I think for us, predictive elements is a good check. So if our theory, you know, if our theory is, is strong and valid, it should have some, should be able to predict, you know, have predict some predictive power. Um, it will depend. I mean, we do, we also talk about kind of theoretical models versus data-driven models. So on the theoretical end, you know, we'll work with people who may don't have any data, but what they want to do is do a study of bringing together what is known, what is understood, and being explicit about that. Um, and uh, bringing that together, and yeah, so it will, it will depend. So that's on the one extreme. The other extreme will be more data-driven. And then, you know, it's also about, I mean, is, as much as like in, in feature engineering and machine learning, you know, you there will be an exp exploratory phase where you're figuring out what is kind of hypothesizing about what is relevant to the domain, what factors are important, and it's a good a good starting point. So it will be it will be similar to that. Yeah. Does that answer? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean. Sorry, so game theory, how relevant is game theory? Um, I'm not an expert in game theory. Um, I you know, understand very little of it, really. But game theory would be one kind of theory and understanding about how people behave. Um, I think we, we don't try to, we try to be more, we don't really adopt much game theoretic kind of concepts. Um, I think it's probably, 
I'm not an expert, but there's quite a trend away from that kind of thinking and thinking more, you know, and as data, as we're collecting more and more data about what people actually do, we're trying to model kind of closer to that and away from the kind of assumptions underlying game theory. If that makes, does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. And we've got perhaps one last question before we close. I can imagine that your model has a lot of parameters, a lot of inputs, and the output is based on the Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, what kind of techniques do you use to actually fine tune those parameters? Uh, do you just like, yeah. force it, or are there some smart techniques to find the optimal? We well, we um, we have used a tried a number of things over the years. I mean, we we tend to you know working with Python and working in a highly and this is highly iterative, right? Highly iterative, highly agile. So we will rather than spend a lot of time focusing on uh, finding the optimum for some particular problem. I think our data scientists understand that even if they were to spend the computational power to find that optimum next week, it may not be relevant anymore. So we're very cautious in how kind of how much we um, how we search through that. There are often kind of multi-objective optimization problems as well. So we'll have you know a number of criteria at the macro level, and then we'll also be training kind of at the micro level as well if we have that level of, of data. Um, we tend to use, I mean, we tend to use just sampling, Latin hypercube sampling, to get a good broad view. We don't really do much kind of goal-directed kind of optimization. We have used we have used some genetic algorithm type techniques in the past, but we found that the cost of kind of running them has been, you know, hasn't the value we're getting from finding that solving that particular problem. Hasn't, hasn't always been worth it because the models are changing and iterating so quickly, if that makes sense. Yeah. Lovely. We'll, we'll finish it there. You're around for the whole weekend? I am, yeah. Lovely. We're around, yeah. Well, Thomas and Fred will both be here, so if you have any more questions, do ask. Please them. do. But thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs>